Hi, everyone. Welcome to the HTML and CSS course by Hacker School. So uh, first of all, I just want to welcome all of you to, if you'd like, to move closer and move together inwards. So that way, if you have questions or any problems, you can like go to your neighbors left and right and just ask. Right? But if you guys don't want to move, we have two helpers who are walking around. Can you wave your hands? So the two of them will be around to help out with any questions or difficulties that you encounter. Yeah. So a short introduction. My name is Kai. And I've been doing this roughly two or three times. So hopefully, this time, I'm getting better. But yeah, yes. So you can access the slides on slides.lik.ai. So that way, you can follow along and you know jump around the slides if you want. Yep, pretty easy to remember. Just give a couple seconds here and there. All right. Anyone here still needs this slide? Nobody? All right. So what is HTML and CSS? So they sound very intimidating to me when I first started, when I heard like, wow, oh, HTML, CSS, acronyms, right? But HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language, and CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets. It still feel very complicated, but when you start writing, they, you start to wonder why they have even such complicated names to begin with. Right? So why do you want to learn HTML and CSS? So for me, the primary reason is, well, it's used to use it's used to build web pages, and you can share your creation with the world. Whatever you build, right, you can share it to anyone across the world. Right? A person in Antarctica might be able to look at your website, even though you're sitting here in the sweating hot sun in Singapore. So yeah, uh, HTML and CSS to me is like an endless canvas where you can like just do whatever you want, whenever you, you want, as long as you know how to do it. And I guess that's why most of you are here. Yeah. So what are we going to make today? It's going to start from like beginner steps, right? We're going to build like a personal portfolio that when you build it, you can share it with friends and family members. And you, know, you can even show it to potential employers in the future, right? They'll be impressed like, oh, you have a personal web page? That's kind of rare nowadays, right? So this personal web page portfolio is going to look a bit like this. So it's going to look very clean and slick. And then you have like a few links at the bottom. Then you're going to add something a bit cute, I guess. going to like try to get a cat image. And yeah, we can get a cat image. Yeah, why not, right? So to start off with, what you will need is two very simple things. Right? You can choose between either one of them. If you're advanced, you kind of know your way around coding. You can choose a later option. But I'll be going with repo.it, which is simply put like a server owned by someone else that you can play around with. So there's no setup involved. There's, not, there's no installation. It's all on the web. So what you can do is just click on it. If you don't have the slides, this is slides.lik.ai. There's a slide number I'm not quite sure. Let me find it out. Slide number six, I guess. Yep. So when we write code, when we write HTML and CSS, it's something that a computer has to understand. 
So when you write code, you have to be precise. What I mean is, if you miss like a squiggly, like when you write code and maybe you see like a squiggly line below, it probably means that you know the computer doesn't understand you, and it could include stuff like uh, empty spaces, extra slashes, extra quotes, then the computer won't be able to understand what you're writing. Then you won't get the result that you want. So if you encounter this sort of cases where you were seeing something and now you're getting a blank screen, that probably means that the computer doesn't understand you and has crashed. Yeah, right. The HTML is now blank. But the parts that are content, meaning things like who you are, the links, right, the images, all these are free from content that you can write whatever you want. You don't have to follow me. Uh, your name is not Kai, right? So you don't have to copy it exactly as I do. Yeah, that's where you get freedom to play around. All right, so every single web page, when you go to say google.com, when you type it into the address, it does like some lookup, but eventually what you do is you download index.html to your web browser like Chrome, Safari, right? And your browser will ask, hey, can I have index.html? And somewhere, somewhere around the world, there will be a server, a single computer responding back and saying, yeah, here you go. Here's index.html, right? And your browser will receive it and now it can display it to you. And that's how HTML works. It's how web pages work in general. This is a bit simplified, but this is all you have to do in your mental model about how index.html works. Right, so to start off with, index.html is returned using HTML. So it's a every single HTML would have HTML tags. And one thing to understand about HTML tags is you have to open and close them, right? So you have to open and close them. You have to open and close them. Simple enough, right? You open a button, you have to close a button. You have to open a HTML, you have to close a HTML, right? Except for these two very commonly used edge cases, either an image or an input, these are known as self-closing HTML tags, then you would just have a single slash at the back. So the most common two HTML tags you will see is the head and body. And I like to think of it as uh, a person, right? Your head describes like certain metadata, it tells how the person to move and what to move. But when it comes to doing the actual moving, it's the body that's doing all the actions. So body contains all of the visual content that you as a user see, but the head is invisible, right? Unless you really dig into it, it's not shown to the user. So this is the most basic HTML page you can have where it starts off with a doc type at the start, which tells the browser that this is indeed a HTML file. Then you have a HTML tag opening. Within it, you have a H HTML tag opening containing a title tag portfolio. This portfolio is content that you are free to change. And within the body, it says, hi, I'm Kai. That's also content which you're free to change. So if we go to the raffle.it, This is what you should see, right? 
So in general, how this works is on the left, you have your file browser that you can see that there are two, folder, uh, two files and one folder. So what you're looking at is an index.html file. Then at the center, at the very top, you have run. And when you click run, you should see, hi, I'm blank, right? That's where you get to change things. So if you change it, if you change it and click run again, yep, you're getting, hi, I'm Kai. If you click this button that says open in a new tab, what you get is your web page in a new tab. And you see that the title that you put in, right, it appears on a new tab tab content. So it says portfolio. If you change it to something else, you display something else. All right, everyone following? Cool. Okay, so how do we start to add more content? So on a web, it used to have, it used to be more or less a document format, which means it used to follow a lot of what newspapers and printing industries used to follow. So we have headings. And the headings are ranging from H1, which means the most important heading in the document, to H6, which means not that important. So it is generally a good practice to only have a single H1 tag in your web page. But H2 to H6, you can have as many as you want. Right, so let's add a heading tag. You see that I made a mistake, so let's fix this. When you click run, you should now see that your heading has become big and bold. Now I add another line, a H2, and now it looks different. Now I have more content. But in this case, you will notice that H2 looks smaller, and that's intended. This is how browsers will display most of your web pages. Right, if you go to like newyorktimes.com, you see that giant heading, that's probably a H1 underneath. Okay. So how do we add images? Like I mentioned, image is a self-closing tag. And in general, what you want to do is within the self-closing tag, you have attributes, right? So we have a SRC attribute, which is a shorthand for source, which you provide a link to an image, which the browser will then download and display it. Then your ALT, attribute, which stands for out or alternative, is where you place a description of your image. So this is used for people who are, who have like some mental, uh, not mental, sorry, visual disability, right? They will be unable to view your image due to maybe they are blind. In that case, then your out, your alternative description will be displayed to them instead. So let's add an image. So I have already included an image in the folder structure. As you can see, it's under image folder, and I call it building.jpg. So what we're going to do is just add it here. And if you click run, you should see an image that is very, very big. Like 
way too big, but it's fine. We're gonna add styling later on to make this prettier, but in general, this is what you should see. You mean this? All right, I'll increase the font size. Again, if you guys encounter any problems, we have helpers around. So just raise your hands and they'll come to you to help you. Sorry? Uh, you mean this website link? Uh, yeah, you can find it on page six of the slides and click on a repo.it icon. Uh, slides, uh, the link is here, slides.lik.ai. Yeah. yeah, the slides are avail available at slides.lik.ai. For those who are faster, maybe you would want to find a nice image that you would like to put and replace it. All right, I'll try to move on. If you still have any questions, just feel free to raise your hands anytime. Okay. So the next step we're trying to do is we're just going to add like tiny little boxes around our content. And what all these content containers are going to do is they're going to encapsulate or rather like box up the content that we want so that when we try to style them later on or when we try to move them around, they are easy, right? it's not so complicated and there is a good idea of the division between things. So the two containers I'm going to add is a header, a H group, and a div. Okay, actually it's more than two. Yeah. Header, H group, div, and main. So some of these are quite intuitive, like main tag stands for the main content, and the header tag stands for the header. Right. The more confusing ones would be H group, which is used to contain a group of heading tags. And what you will more commonly see around the web when you open up web pages is the div tag. So div stands for divider, and it's used for separating out content everywhere. Like if you run out of options and you don't have a good idea of what HTML tag to use, div is probably the one that you should fall back on. Yep. So let's try to add containers. Yeah, if you're lazy like me, you can copy.
right? Uh, Rapport.it also come with a very convenient auto format function, just right here, like one tiny button at the top, and you can press it to make your HTML look easier to look at. So you see that in my body tag, I have a header tag, I have a H group tag, in which I have a H1 tag, H2 tag. Now, oh, if you run it, you shouldn't see any changes to your HTML file because what we just did is just to wrap the containers around and they shouldn't add any new content or change the layout. I think if you're looking to the slides, right, I think there are a few mistakes. One is in a H group here, there should be a forward. This should be an ending H group tag. So it should have a slash right here at the start. And similarly for this, there should also be a slash at the start of this one, this ending tag. So we have a general structure of a web page that you are able to show your friends and family already, but we want to add more content and more structure to our HTML page. And one co very common use case is to add a list of things. Like maybe you're trying to do like a checklist, a to-do list, uh, maybe just listing some ingredients for a recipe, stuff like that. That's where you would normally use lists. So HTML does come with lists and they come in two variants. You have your ordered list, which means that things that are going to be countable and I guess a one, two, three, four, five, six kind of step. So it's called an ordered list, but ordered list is really long to type. So programmers shorten it to OL and list items is shortened to li so the second variant of list is called the unordered list which is why it's shortened to ul so let's try to add list to our html page And we're going to add it under name. Going to add. I know. OL tag. Then we're going to add uh, some list items. You can add as many list items as you like. There. Doesn't have to be two, you can add more.
So we added an ordered list. So if you scroll all the way down, you should see a list, right? With one dot something, two dot something. And if you add more, the numbers should appear. Now we just added an unordered list. So if you display it, what it should get you is dotted, uh, bulleted list, I guess. And that's how you add list. Uh, if you want to style the numbers and style the bullets, this is not very easy. Yeah, so just letting you know beforehand. So we've added lists and we kind of told visitors to you know, follow us at Instagram and Twitter and all our social media platforms, but it's kind of hard for them to actually do so because we haven't added any links to the social media platforms, right? So the next step, we're gonna be adding links. On a web, it's referred to as anchor links. And we see that anchor links have different meanings because when you're trying to anchor something, it usually means, well, you're gonna lead to somewhere else. So anchor links are shortened to A, the single character HTML tag, which is quite weird, right? And it has one attribute called href, href which stands for hyperlink reference. And that's where you put in the link that you want to put inside the href tag, uh, sorry, inside the href attribute. And when users click on that link, you lead them to wherever href points to. So just clarifying, the content inside href is content. You can replace it with anything you like. So in here, we've added one href, which goes to Instagram. We've added a second one that goes to Twitter. So now you'll see that the links are slightly different, right? The links have blue or blue or purple and have an underline. So this is because links in HTML originally didn't have any styling, 
So this were the default stylings that they came with. And unfortunately, the people who invented web pages weren't thinking of making things look very pretty or beautiful yet. So we have purple color for visited links and blue color for unvisited links. So again, I just want to emphasize, please change the links they are used for demonstration purposes. So for those who weren't here just now, uh, I sort of demonstrated the final HTML form that the HTML page that we're making. And I included a form where you can submit to get a picture of a cat, right? So the next step, we're gonna do is to add a form to retrieve pictures of cats. So how do we add a form? So form starts with a form HTML tag, and inside there we have labels, input, and buttons. So inputs are used for interactive content. That's where people can start adding uh, their own interactions, their own input, like their name, then you can uh, use that input to do interesting stuff. So what input are we adding here is a number input. So users are encouraged to add a number, right? So when they fill up the number and they click submit, they are getting an image of a cat corresponding to how many pixels wide it is. So you put in one pixel, you're gonna get one pixel cat. And if you put in 2,000, you're gonna get an image of a cat 2,000 pixels wide. Yeah. So of course, every form needs to have a submit button or else uh, the form doesn't really work. So that's why we're adding a button HTML tag there that says submit. So let's try adding this form to our HTML. So this form goes to at the end of the main content, and we want to put it at the end. So in general, what we call the content at the bottom of a web page is a footer, and that's what we're going to add. So the form goes here, and we have an action attribute. Right, so we've added a form, and inside the form, there is going to be an input and a label. So an input and a label usually comes together, right? The label is used to describe what the input is for, and here we are adding a label called with to our input, which is also called with. So the name attribute here must correspond with the for attribute in the label. And that's how uh, the computer can help people with visual disabilities to identify which forms correspond to which. Then we're going to add our submit button.
So let's click Run. And at the bottom of the page, you should see this input where you can type in numbers. And a Submit button where you can click on it. And you should get a picture of a cat. All right. Anyone here not getting a picture of a cat? Right. If you're not getting a picture of a cat, uh, it probably means you've typed something wrong. So a good way to fix it would be to copy, the, copy it from the slides, I guess. If you want to get back your original index.html, you have to refresh. Uh, what we did was uh, redirect. So same thing if you went to like the Twitter tag, uh, Twitter image, then you have to refresh. For those of you wondering what this two attributes doing in the form HTML tag is doing, uh, this goes a bit beyond the current understanding of how a web page works. So in general, I would just like to encourage you to just take it as it is for now. If you're interested, you, there are like further readings where you can read up on how the form tag works, what additional attributes are in there, and what else you can do with it. Okay, so now we have a HTML, HTML web page that looks quite reasonable. It was sort of weird layout where you have this giant image in between. So now we're going to add styles. And this is where things are going to get a lot prettier. And this is where more or less your creativity will come in, where you can play around with different sorts of stylings and different kinds of background colors, in fact, different kinds of text colors, different types of fonts and stuff like that. Right, CSS is what I would like to call as uh, fun because y there's so many ways that you can play around with, but people tend to get frustrated because they uh, don't have the mastery around, H H uh, around CSS, so I tend to get frustrated. Yeah. So how does the CSS come into play, right? So I me previously mentioned a HTML file and a CSS file. So when the browser has received the index.html file, the server re uh, sends it to you, your browser, right? Then when your browser is reading through index.html, it will find a need to go fetch an additional file called style.css. And then the server will send the CSS file then it will read it, then add it to your HTML file, then display it to the user. So there are going to be, I'm not sure if all of you have encountered this, but you went to a web page, you know, it starts loading, and it's really ugly, then it just stops there. And it's not the usual site that you are used to, it stops uh, very differently. That's probably because the style.css file got lost along the way or there was a bug with the CSS file. So it wasn't displaying correctly. So CSS is in charge of all the displaying, the styling, the beautification of your site.
So how do we add a CSS file? Okay. The answer is in the head, because the head, like I mentioned just now, contains metadata. It doesn't actually contain any content that the user will see. So we're going to add this link HTML tag, which contains a REL attribute. I'm not quite sure what that stands for, but it probably means like what the link contains. And again, a href attribute, which stands for hyperlink reference. That's where we're going to point to our style.css file and have the browser go and fetch it for us. So back to repo.it. So our head only has a title. Let's add a link. So you shouldn't see anything change yet. And that's because our style.css file is currently empty, right? So you should try to double check if, the, if what you wrote corresponds to what I wrote. So web pages were invented in the 1980s. So that's quite a long time ago, right? Uh, so along the way, we use a browser to display HTML and CSS files. And along the way, there has been a lot of craft around CSS and HTML. So browsers tend to differ between themselves on how to display a normal web page. And the rules tend to differ slightly so if you go to Chrome and open this same website, or go to Firefox, Safari, uh, Android, right? Your web page would look slightly different in some ways, and that's usually not what we want. Like if you have a user who's using some very unknown browser, suddenly it would look very, very different, and that's not what we want. So the community around CSS has come together and build a generalized solution. And we call it a normalize.css. And this normalization tends to uh, smooth out all the rough edges around all the browser differences. And it, they can come in different names. So the few are normalize.css, uh, reboot.css, um, and among other things. But those are the two most common ones. Anyone, of here, anyone here have heard of Bootstrap? Bootstrap? No? Well, OK. Uh, so Bootstrap is a very commonly used CSS solution to building giant web pages. And it tends to lead to like a normalization of styling between web pages. And that's why you see, like, oh, this looks very familiar to the other side. Well, they're probably using the same Bootstrap CSS. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to add another style sheet. But this time, instead, we're going to get it from Bootstrap. And we're going to get Bootstrap reboot CSS file. So this has a very long name. I'm sorry, but there's no way around it. We just got to like, copy this link. Is what I would recommend. And just paste it. Right. Now this time, if you look closely at the font, it's going to look different. Right. So from a serif font, we went from 
a serif to a sans serif font. Yeah. So there's no like weird curly edges. Now it's blocky, it's modern. And your submit button would look a bit different as well. So it's probably not as rounded as before. I'm not sure about you guys, but I generally type, uh, like my web pages to look a bit more cleaner. And I like my fonts to look different from what everyone else is using. So I tend to like move away from Arial, you know, Hel Helvetica, those sort of usual choices. So I like to add fonts, and fonts tend to make very big differences in web pages. And it's a good way to like un place yourself and make yourself unique. So let's try to add fonts. And the font we're going to use comes from Google Fonts, which provides fonts for free. There is probably like some privacy concern because every time you go and download fonts, Google knows what fonts you're downloading and they can probably like track you based on what fonts you've downloaded from them before and stuff like that. But it's free fonts, right? If you want to purchase your own, they normally cost can cost from like a hundred dollars per hundred thousand page views to like tens and thousands of dollars for every million page views, which is really steep. So Google Fonts looks like this, and you can like play around with it to find like fonts that you like. It's generally very powerful. So these are like the common fonts that people download. You can play around, you can select, say you would like railway, and you can add them and Google will provide inf instructions on how you can export this to your HTML page. Right. You can dig into this later. We're just going to follow what I have which is we're going to add a Montserrat font and an Open Sans font. So these two normally work together quite well and they look quite good. So again, we're just going to copy this entire line and drop it in. Again, you shouldn't see anything change yet because we haven't added anything to our style.css. So we are going to add styles later on that tells the browser how to display the fonts that we like. But we'll dig into it shortly. So it's approaching an hour. Um, so just a general question. Does anyone here prefer a break of about five minutes before we continue? All right. 
All right, seems like there's agreement. So we'll take a five minutes break and come back at 2 p.m. So the bootstrap link that we dropped just now is called the bootstrap reboot and it comes with a set of resetting CSS stylings that tend to normalize like browser differences and adds in a few good defaults for like font stylings and stuff. If you're curious you can look it up like bootstrap reboot is your Google search term. No, not yet. Yeah, not yet. Because we haven't added styles that change your fonts. Yeah, we only added the fonts, yes. Hmm? Uh, that was a previous CSS. You remember the bootstrap reboot thing that we added? Yeah. That's what changed the fonts. Where do you click the link? Ah, interesting. <laughs> hmm. So you go back to the repo that I see. So you like, could you refresh? Refresh? I think it's too far already. Ah, no, it shouldn't. Okay. <laughs> now if you click. Oh, oh yeah. that's good. So just refresh, yeah. Yeah, oh, we can click that. I think 
uh, it might have been a bug on their side. Yeah, so when you edit, when you edit something, it's supposed to like, create a new web page belonging to you, but I think the link wasn't updated. Yeah. Yeah, you can change it. Yeah, I'm just like using this as a default for everyone else. Yeah, because you know, picking your own fonts take like a long time. Yeah. Hey, the next question is Hey, interesting questions. So how do you put a picture found on Google in a website? So the web pages have a long history of how it works. And basically whenever you download something, it consumes other people's resources. So that's why when you try to directly copy a link to a Google, to, to like an external site, it won't work because serving images consume a lot of CPU resources. So web pages generally don't allow you to do that. Instead, what you should do is right click, save to computer, upload it to your own folder. Then that way you can host your own images. and how to insert comments in a code. So comments in HTML starts with an exclamation mark at the very start. So open tag, exclamation mark, dash, dash. Type in your comment, and you end it with dash, dash, ending anchor. Try out, uh, demonstrate it. So this is how you add a comment to HTML. How to add JS or PHP in. Uh, so if you're interested in adding JavaScript code, you can add it. Uh, we will have future courses that dig into how JavaScript works, and you can explore. If you want to get started ahead, you can go look up script HTML text, and that's how you add JavaScript. Can you explain each section of the form again? Okay, sure. <laughs> right, so, Going back and explaining the forms again to people who weren't following, uh, we have a footer tag. So this is a content container. This doesn't really do anything to a form. The part, actual parts of the form is these few lines, right? So you have a opening form HTML tag and a ending form HTML tag. And you have a label and input that comes together as a pair. The label describes what the input is doing and input does the interactive part where you can type in stuff or drag sliders and click buttons. Then you have your actual submit button to submit the form and this is how it works. If you require additional clarification, I've added a further reading link at the bottom of every single slide. So if you're interested and not sure what's uh, additional information that you need, you can go click on it and read up. Okay, so let's get back to the content. So just now we downloaded style.css file, but we haven't added any styling. So we're going to add some CSS now. 
this is just to test if you know the CSS works. So what this is is we're telling the browser to display our body HTML tag with a background that is teal color. So this time instead of editing index.html, we're going to edit style.css. So like HTML tags, you also have an opening and closing, but the opening and closing is this braces. If you're not sure where to find the keys, it's right before your backspace, like around that region before, right below your equal key. And you have to press shift. So if you run this, your background should change. Nope. Hmm. Yep, okay, so I think I made a mistake. So let's try this. Okay. Hmm. Never mind, forget what I just said. Uh, we're not changing the background to teal because, well, even I got CSS wrong. So that's frustrating. Uh, yeah. So I think there is a bug in this style, but it's okay because we're going to throw it away and add fonts after all. So this time I'll assure you that this works, okay? Because I just tried it. So what we're doing here is we're adding a font family to the body H, uh, the body of the HTML file. And for all the headings like H1 to H6, we're going to use a different font family and we're going to use a different font weight. So font weights range from like 100 to 900 in general. And as you go up higher and higher, the thicker and bolder your font will be. So 800 is pretty bold. Never mind. Okay, I just debunked and I know what the problem is. So how it works in CSS is that every subsequent CSS overrides the CSS at, at the very top. So what we just did was modify CSS at the very top, 
that Bootstrap will overwrite for us. So that's why nothing is changing. So if you move this line down here, the background teal color after five minutes. <laughs> okay. So by adding these new styles, your font should look slightly different. Okay, so just now we edited some CSS properties and those CSS properties correspond to HTML tags like body or head. But we're just trying to amend it such that we can use it in other places as well. So I'll cover how classes are reusable in the future. But for now, we're going to introduce the concept of a CSS class. So a class is added to a HTML tag as an attribute. So here we're adding the intro class to our header HTML tag. Then in our style.css, we're going to say, make the intro class have a height of 50%. So let's do this too. So nothing has changed yet because we haven't added the class to our HTML. So this is a very basic CSS class. And now we're going to dig into the more complicated aspects of Flexbox. So Flexbox is a CSS property that is uh, defines how we lay out elements in our HTML. So it all starts with this property called display flex. And it tells the browser that we want to initiate a flex box. Then additional properties like flex direction, justi justify content, align items, align content, tells how the browser to lay out the content in a flex box. So in my further, read, further reading links, there is this website called flexboxfroggy.com that you can play and learn Flexbox. So it's like, oh, you need to get the frog onto the lily pad. And the way to do, is it, do this is, you know, flex justify content flex 
and yeah, and we move the froggy from the left to the right. And now we have to move the green froggy onto the green lily pad and the yellow froggy to the yellow lily pad. And we use justified content center to do this. So you can keep playing around with all these various uh, flexbox stylings and attributes. I'm not going to cover all of them, but this is a very fun exercise and a really good way to learn. Uh, if you're interested, I have I should have additional links. But if you're not, you can look up Flexbox Playground. And this is a site that I go to quite regularly to visualize like all the different things. Like you have flex, uh, different flex align items properties. It's like align items start and center baseline stretch. You have your justify content. Like I mentioned just now, you have center, space around, space between, flex end, flex start. And in general, a lot of properties to play around with to understand and visualize what they do and how they change things. So what we expect here in this intro header class is it's going to center our content. So let's add that in to our style.css. And add the intro header class to our intro header over here at the H group. So class equals to intro dash header. And now we're going to add a few additional properties to add spacing around our elements. So spacing is used to make your elements feel less stuffy and give them a bit more room to breathe. So one very common attribute that I like to use is called the padding. And padding use, used to give like additional space between elements. And a unit that is quite common is REM, which stands for some value in a browser, where one REM stands for the default font size set on the HTML. So let's add padding left for now, just this property. And what we should expect is the header should move 
slightly right because we've added padding to the left of it. So if you notice, we have some padding here that is white space and we move the content around. If you change this from 1.5 to 2, you move even more. So 7 REM looks like that. And let's add the container. So the padding shorthand is a easy way to define paddings for all the four directions. So up, down, left, right. So instead of writing padding left, padding right, padding top, padding top, padding bottom, you write padding 1.5 REM. Then when you add it to the div, you should see that the div has padding all around it. Right now we see that the image has changed slightly. There's this additional white space over here. And similarly, at the bottom, there is also some padding. So there is a very good way to remember the padding shorthand, which is it goes clockwise. So up, like starting from 12 o'clock, it's up. Then going clockwise is 3 o'clock, 6, 9. So it's to your direction, it should look like this, right? So like this. So up, and if we change it such that the top is, the uh, sorry, the left and right is like 8 REM, then you should see that the top is, top and bottom should be 1.5, the left and right is 8. Now if we add another one, now it should point to the bottom. So your bottom now has like 7 REM. We're just going to keep it to all four directions. So we're going to dig into the very, very technical parts of CSS and HTML. It's okay if you don't fully understand what's going on now, because for me, it took me a while to understand this. So what we have here is like three layers, the margin, border, and padding. And this is what is used to describe the box model. And at the center, we have our content, which I call it lorem ipsum. So for you guys, it would be like, hi, I'm blah, blah, blah. That would be your content box. And a padding box, which is what we added just now, is to add some padding. And the border box, which we're not going to cover today, but a border, like an image frame, basically adds like a thick border around your image and box. Then we have margin, which is outside of the border. And the margin interacts differently compared to the padding, which I won't go into as well. 
but a margin is a different way to separate your content because it is outside of your box rather than the inside so it tends to interact differently so for those of you who have this slide open this is actually interactive so if you drag this the margin should drop to zero and this is one two three so you can like try to imagine how the box model works So if you guys encounter any difficulties in the future and you're frustrated, like why isn't this laying out the way I want it to, it is a good idea to review your box model and try to understand how it interacts with other boxes around. Okay, so I know it's very frustrating to have like this giant big blue image staring right at you and that's because we haven't added any styling to style images so by default if you don't add any styling your image will be as big as it is so it, if it is like 15,000 pixels it's going to be 15,000 pixels across all browsers and that's not what we want like if you view this on a mobile phone 15,000 pixels is a lot. So what we're going to do is add a class called intro-image and we're going to use this object fit CSS property. So in the further readings, it goes into a bit more like how object fit works. So the one we use is object fit cover, which means like if it goes beyond the range of its width and height, it will be cropped. If you want it to be within the box, but have like white space to the left and right or top and bottom, then you can use contain, or you can use fill to like stretch it out, and like none, which does certain different things, and scale down where it's quite similar to contain. So we're going to use object fit cover, and we're going to make our box uh, height and width 100%, which means it will be constrained by our browser view port. So if our browser is very wide, it can be very wide, but if our browser is very tiny, it will be only as tiny as the screen. So back to style.css, intro-image, it's going to add it into our image tag right here. So class So if you've done this correctly, our image is no longer gigantic. It is only as big as our browser. Right, so our web page looks pretty good now. It's no longer as, you know, as sudden as before, where you're presented with a giant image. You guys can feel free to play around with the other object fit properties. Okay, so classes, like I mentioned before, can be reused. 
and that's the power of CSS classes and in general why we tend to write all of our CSS styles in classes instead of uh, the body HTML, H1, H2, H3 tags. So by reuse, it sort of reduces the amount of work that we have to do because we can simply apply styles repeatedly to the common el elements that we want. So you can try to imagine like if you have uh, list items, like maybe seven or eight of them, you don't have to write individual repeated styles for all of the list items. We already have the container CSS class. So it's pretty simple. We just have to add it to our main HTML, uh, HTML tag and our footer HTML tag. By doing so, you should see that your main content, which means like the I know something, 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 as well as the form at the bottom, like get a cat, it should have some padding around it. So the web page has come a long way since its 1980s root, especially CSS, because when HTML was invented, mobile phones weren't a thing yet, and people weren't in general thinking that we would have content that could be handheld and fit within your palm. So the web page was never designed to be read or used on a very small screen, and that's why the very, very old web pages, if you visit them, they will look very weird and you probably have to scroll around. So the modern web page is responsive. And what responsive means is it is responsive to all the different browser widths across the world. So if you have a tiny Nokia phone or a tablet, a laptop, or maybe a TV screen, your web page would look great across all the different screen sizes. And how we achieve that is through this property called media query. So media query is a way to define and change CSS depending on how wide or how tiny the screen is. So what we see here is if the screen exceeds 1920 pixels, the CSS is going to be changed. It's going to be applied to our CSS. So instead of the usual intro left 1.5 REM, we're going to say, let's change it such that the padding left is 10% of the screen width. So the way to do this is you can add this in anywhere. And in fact, if you want, you can change the amount of pixels that this triggers, as well as the amount of padding that you want. Now we're going to add a new CSS class. So remember that class was called intro-left. 
and we're going to add it to our uh, H group HTML tag. So up to now, our CSS classes has always been singular. We haven't had applying multiple CSS classes. So in a class HTML tag you, uh, attribute, you can actually add more than one CSS class. So let's add intro dash left here. And press run. So the web page should still look the same on smaller screen sizes, but if you expand it, I'm not actually not sure if my screen is wide enough now. <coughs> Let me change it. So let's pick a smaller number because my screen's too small. Yep. So if you take a look at the heading, the high I'm something something, it triggers at a certain breakpoint. When it exits seven, six, eight pixels, the CSS class gets applied. So instead of padding left 1.5 REM, it goes to padding left 10%. So it should look something like that. So bring back up media queries. It is generally a good practice to add quite a few media queries to be applied on mobile phones, uh, slightly bigger mobile phones, then tablets, uh, laptop screens, then desktop screens. So those numbers would be something like uh, 768 for mobile screens and below. Uh, 1024 for tablets, then 1376 for laptops, and 1920 for desktop screens. So those are numbers that you'll probably be familiar with. Okay. So I mentioned 568, uh, 576 pixels. So this means that on mobile screens, it's going to remain the same, but if it's above a media screen, it's larger than a mobile phone. We're going to apply these three CSS classes. So we have our original intro, display flex, but we're going to add a height attribute to limit its height to 80 rem. And we're going to change our intro left so that it does more things. It's now it's going to expand as much as possible. And instead of a 10% padding, we're only going to add 5%. And we're going to add a new CSS class called intro dash right that does almost the same thing. It's going to expand and take up 50% of the width. So that's quite a lot to write. I'm going to copy instead. So you should notice something that if I exit 576, it's going to trigger and change styles. 
So instead of being top to bottom, it's going to go left to right. And we've added an additional CSS class called intro dash right, right? So we're going to add it to our image because it should go to the right side. So now your website should look pretty great, in my opinion. It should look quite stunning. And at the bottom, you have all the relevant links that you want to show your employees. And it can get a cat as well. So I'll go a bit in depth into what this flex property does. So you can see that it's one space zero space 50% 50 50 and what this means is we are going to specify how it will grow and shrink when the space is given to them. So flex one means that when, a, when there is additional space we want intro left to grow as big as it wants to and the second zero, it means that if there isn't enough space, it shouldn't shrink. It should remain as big as it was before running out of space. And the third property, 50%, is going to request that if it can try to stay around 50% of the screen width, or rather the amount of width within the box, so other properties include flex 0, 0, 50%. And what this means is it's not going to grow if there is additional space. It's going to stay at 50%. And you can also add things like uh, 0, 1, 50%. So if there is not enough space, it's going to shrink and stuff like that. So all these properties you can learn on the Flexbox Froggy site that I showed you. So it's a good practice to like just like play around and gain some experience on what all these properties do and it will help you achieve a lot of different weird layouts that uh, in your head that you actually want to achieve. So what's remaining is we're almost done with the entire HTML and CSS course. I'm just going to give you guys around 5 to 10 minutes to play around with all the weird things that you have learned. So if you want to add new images, new lists, new div tags, uh, new links, feel free to do it. And I'll, at the end, I'll show you how you can have a website that you can share with your friends and family.
Okay, so I'm going to uh, show you guys how you can share this website with your friends and family. So the platform that we're using is called repo.it. So it does come with a very convenient open in a new tab link that you can just press. So if you open in the new, uh, if you click on this button over here, open a new tab, what it will have is this link. If you're seeing it's uh, li-ki, li probably means the link is wrong. You shouldn't be seeing my site. If you refresh, you should see yours. So if you refresh, it's okay. Your changes will still be there. But you can open in a new tab and you should have your site here. So you can actually copy this and share with anyone around the world and they will be able to see it. If you want to have your own website, like your custom domain, right? You can click on um, this custom domain button and try to figure things out. In general, what you will need is to pay a certain amount of money to purchase a domain. So the good site to go to would be namecheap.com. So namechip.com is a domain registrar, which means that you can find like weird uh, websites to buy. All right, so it does seem like this address is available. It costs around $9 a year, which is pretty cheap if you think about it. It's like one Starbucks venti frappe mochaccino a year, right? So you can buy it. So I won't actually buy the domain, but what in general I can show you is another site. So uh, there is namechip.com. Another site that you can use is pockbun.com. So pockbun.com is also a domain registrar but it's a bit cuter and prices are more affordable. So I do actually have an account here. And I have a few domains. So with this domain that you just bought and purchased, you can actually come back here and set it up such that it links to your own domain. Then you can have your own website So for me, my name is very short and common. So L-I-K-A-I is my full name. So it's very hard for me to like buy a custom domain. So I actually bought this lik.ai website. And this is where my portfolio is hosted. So you guys can have the same thing. Like just be creative with your domain name and play around. And you can also have other things like this link right that you're seeing and using it's also my website but hosted on a slightly different domain yep. so to host your domain you can use repo.it or you can use a whole other various set of services like netlify.com it's a good way to host your website netlify.com or if you already have a github account github comes with github pages which hosts your website for free as well so you can use github pages to host your websites Additionally, if you're a very common line person, 
you may like Zite.co, which is also yet another way to deploy websites. The better thing about this is you can deploy more than just static sites like HTML and CSS. You can add in things like a server, you can add in things like a, say a Django backend or a Node.js backend and stuff like that. Okay, so I'm just going to answer any additional questions that you have here. Right. So how do you change a cat picture to another picture? So this is quite a bit more complicated. You will have to understand how forms work in general. So the website I use to get cat images is called cat as a service so it provides all the cat images that you see so far so with all these like uh, restful api services you can go play around with them and try to get different images i believe you can get things like dog as a service as well yep and stuff like that If you guys click on a final product reference, you should be able to see this final site that I made, which is quite a bit cleaner and some additional styles. It does some optimizations like compresses the images to various different screen sizes, such that you don't have to download a very big image size. How to change font color. So the font color CSS style is called uh, color, C-O-L-O-R, because uh, internet technology was invented in the United States. So we have to go with their spelling. Yeah, so if you change a color to something else like pink or red, you should be able to see it. So. Like what I did here was change my color to light pink. So you should see that my color is light pink. If you change this to say blue, it will turn blue. Yep. How to replace a building image with a GIF? Well, this is actually quite simple. Um, as long as you upload the new GIF file and you make a hypertext reference to it, you should be able to display a GIF. So if you change this, you should be able to get a GIF. So just change the source attribute to a link, either local or foreign, and you should be able to get a GIF. Okay. Can we add emoji? Uh, yes. So if you add an emoji here, it should just appear. Uh, so let me find the cat emoji.
I'm going to add an emoji. And it should just appear like that. So it's now around 3 o'clock, so I think that's it. Thanks everyone for coming here. And if you guys have any feedback, please fill in this form, bit.ly slash hs 2009 html fb So if you click on this form, we would really appreciate your feedback on how we can do better, as well as what you would like to see us teach in the future.